Hi, everybody. I'm Judy Stevens Long, and I'm the chair of Stevens' dissertation. Um, I'll make a brief introduction, and then Steve will begin his presentation. And after it's over, we'll get a chance to ask some questions. Um, at Fielding, we don't have a defense. This is a final oral presentation to the community, which means that his dissertation has been approved. And uh, we're all thrilled to death about that. We work very hard to try to get it done this year. And uh, I'm, I'm supposed to be retiring now, so <laughs> it's a good thing. Um, I want to say about Stephen that he is uh, one of the most uh, accomplished people that I have had as a student. Um, he has written four books. Is it four books? Yep. Yeah. Including um, The Cult of Trump, Freedom of Mind. Uh, and his dissertation is an attempt to make what we call operationalize or to give a good measurable definition of the bite model of authoritarian control. Um, and this is a way that uh, we hope in the long run will be available to the legal community to be able to talk about how people have come under authoritarian control and use it perhaps as a defense or use it as a prosecutorial device um, to intervene in the, in the lives of really cults. So it's this fascinating work. He's done a lot of terrific work on things like sex trafficking and uh, influenced legal decisions in many places. And this dissertation is just the beginning, I hope, of a long and distinguished career in research. And so with that, Stephen, uh, go ahead with your presentation. We're Thank all you. Thank you so much, Judy. You've been stellar. And uh, really, I couldn't have done it without your help. So I title my dissertation, The Bite Model of Authoritarian Control, Undue Influence, Thought Reform, Brainwashing, Mind Control, Trafficking, and the Law. And I know I did too many words than what dissertations usually have, but I wanted keywords uh, in search for uh, what I'm about to present. And I wanna thank my dissertation another, committee. And please everybody mute um, if, 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 if it's not me. Uh, Judy, uh, Dr. Keith Melville, Rich Applebaum, Michael Commons, and, and Fielding graduate alumni of the media department, Christine Marie Cadis is our, is my, was my student reader. And I guess I wanna start out by saying that the problem is that while the law has remedies for when people take away the rights of others, it's mostly involved with bodily harm or money, but not psychological abuse and trauma and such. But as I'll get into my presentation in my, my deep literature review, I discovered there were efforts to address this problem from different angles. And my hope in doing this work is to create a tool that the legal community can use to understand what's the difference between ethical and unethical uh, uh, influence. Uh, I also want to say uh, it was February of 1974 when I was recruited into a cult of called the Moonies uh, and spent two and a half years uh, in the cult, dropped out of college, etc. That month, Patty Hearst was kidnapped by force out of her apartment by the Symbionese Liberation Army, was on the lam, was arrested, tried, and sent to jail for robbing a, a bank and a sporting goods store. And as a form, I was out by that point through a deprogramming, thanks to my family's love and efforts. It always struck me as I was so lucky not to have committed any crimes 
Um, I also wanted to say tomorrow, November 18th, is the anniversary of the Jonestown massacre with over 913 people, including over 300 children, Congressman Ryan assassinated and Ron Harris from NBC. So for me, this has been a 44 year full-time quest to try to um, be an activist and help solve the problems involved with mind control, et cetera. So this was a picture of Moon being coronated in the Senate Dirksen Senate office building a number of years ago, one of his mass weddings, enough of Moon. And I always like to use this slide in my presentations to try to make it personal to whoever's listening. And that is, how would you know if you were under mind control or if you had been unduly influenced? And the truth is, is it's not so easy because when I was in the cult and my sister and brother-in-law who helped rescue me are on this call, they try to tell me I was brainwashed. They try to tell me I was in a cult, but I was in a blinders situation where I was in a new reality, a new identity. Um, and in fact, the uh, American Psychiatric Association Diagnostic Statistical Manual version five, but the four had it and three names a dissociative disorder that talks about identity disturbance and explicitly says individuals who have been subjected to intense coercive persuasion, e.g. brainwashing, thought reform, indoctrination while captive, torture, long-term political imprisonment, recruitment by sects or cults or by terror organizations. So um, a lot of cults have put out this information that there's no such thing, but in fact, clinicians have been encountering this for decades um, and the simplest way to explain it is when I, uh, who I was before the Moonies, I was a Jew from Queens, by the way, I grew up 1.3 miles from Donald Trump, uh, the poor side of Union Turnpike. Um, but I was a Jew who wrote poetry and played basketball and liked women. And within a few weeks, I became a right wing fascist who thought that democracy was satanic Within a year, I was believing the Holocaust was necessary. Uh, I was fasting for Nixon to be president because God wanted him to be president. So for me, uh, th this journey has been extremely intense over these years, ex especially the last four years. So I just wanted to say that when you think of cults, a lot of people think of people in robes living in isolated places, and that's not useful. In fact, people are in all types of different one over one cults, political cults, therapy cults, religious cults, commercial cults known as trafficking, as well as multi-level marketing groups and large group uh, awareness trainings. When my, when my uh, deprogramming was taking place back in 1976, one of the things that helped me a lot was understanding Chinese communist brainwashing studies. I'm not going to take the time uh, today to, to explain all of these models, but they're all contained within my dissertation in detail because I wanted to pull together all of the most prominent the, uh, theories and models that incorporate undue influence in its varieties of forms. Um, and Lifton has been a mentor, someone I've interviewed multiple times. And in courts of law, Lifton's model, and soon I will get to Margaret Singer's models, have been used uh, in testifying about undue influence. Um, but those uh, were qualitative studies. They were based on interviews with people who had been, uh, who had experienced uh, thought reform or brainwashing and such. And as you will find out towards uh, into this presentation, we, we now have a quantitative uh, study uh, that offers a more concrete uh, model. So in addition to Lifton and Singer, I wanted to add Edgar Schein 
uh, and his book, Coercive Persuasion, that I read when I first got out, and he presented Kurt Lewin, one of the most famous social psychologists model of unfreezing, changing, refreezing. Unfreezing means disorienting a person's sense of self. Changing means the indoctrination into a new ideology and a new identity, and then the refreezing of that identity. And I, when I started my program at Fielding, um, I was surprised. Edgar Schein was like a legend in the field of organizational change and development. And I went, I know his work. This is amazing. Um, and in fact, when I did my, my uh, lit review, I realized, oops, um, I lost my thing. Um, that in 2014, he actually presented a model uh, for uh, that he calls coercive persuasion uh, that I wanted to uh, also include in this presentation. You'll see the themes uh, being called out. Um, for me, as I was learning all of these models, I learned about cognitive dissonance theory that was based on the work of social psychologist Leon Festinger studying a UFO cult where the leader had prophesied that a, a spaceship would land on a mountain at a particular day and time. And he and his students posited that people would lose faith after the spaceship didn't show up. And in fact, people believed more. And that led to the uh, development of the cognitive dissonance model, which says human beings like to be congruent. They like to have things line up between their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And if you change one, the other two will shift to reduce dissonance. And I love that model. So, and, and then I was trying to think of a, a more um, simple way to describe my experience in the moon cult and the many, many people that I went on to help uh, becoming a, a licensed mental health counselor out of cults. And I decided that I could use thought, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, but I, I wanted, there was something else missing and it was information control. And so it, I came about this model called the bite model for those four things. And I decided not to include the slides because there are a lot of details in it, but you can go to my website uh, for the detailed uh, explanation of, of the bite model. And the next slide is my influence continuum that I put together that describes ethical influence, which includes informed consent to destructive unhealthy influence, which is lying, whether it's uh, distorting information, withholding vital information or outright lying. And there are real themes to distinguish ethical versus unethical, what's factual, what's disinformation, as well as what's healthy for leadership and what's unhealthy and types of, of organizations. So this and the bite model become a way that anybody can look at their experience, whether it's a one-on-one, -on -one, or a multi-level marketing group or a corporation that they work for uh, and say, you know what, this is more uh, on the dark side of fear and guilt and control and obedience. Um, one more model I thought I, sh I should include is the idea that most people involved with destructive cults are really, from my point of view, fringe members they're, they don't know what's really going on inside, certainly not at the apex of the pyramid. And so for them that may not feel so totalistic or controlling, um, but my lens is, is, is from, from out here looking in and overall there's a, a, a recipe or a, a, a mechanism to um, uh, evaluate uh, healthy or unhealthy things. So let's see if I can get this to move down. There we go. So I wanted to then, in, in, the, in the lit review, I realized trafficking was passed as a law against enslaving people. And the definition, and I should say the Keith Ranieri Nexium cult, he's in jail for 120 years, and he was 
put in jail because of trafficking laws and not because of undue influence laws, et cetera. And the government defines fraud, uh, force fraud and coercion uh, uh, in terms of trafficking. But this again, overlaps with the themes of the brainwashing and thought reform literature, the coercive persuasion literature, and of course the bite model. And there are quite a few laws that I've included in my dissertation as well. Very interestingly, there has been development in elderly, elder law and there are five models there for evaluating undue influence, but it's all pretty much aimed at getting control of someone's assets or property or money. And I'll just mention that susceptibility, opportunity, disposition, and result, the Soder model, uh, figures uh, strongly. Uh, if for the interest of time and wanting to have uh, lots of questions and answers, I won't go into all of these models, but needless to say, they're all describing the same kind of phenomenon um, of abuse and exploitation by a predator on someone who's vulnerable. And as you see, Margaret Singer's model, the one that I mentioned earlier with the six conditions is cited here as well. And I was shocked to learn that California passed a law on undue influence in 2014. Um, and they, they actually then created a, uh, a, a skilled um, toolkit for uh, elder care workers to evaluate undue influence with, with elderly people. And again, it looks at the vulnerability of the victim, the influencers' uh, authority over them, the specific actions or tactics, as well as uh, uh, the, the um, taking advantage of, uh, of the person. In 2015, one of my mentors, a former law professor emeritus, Alan Shefflin, uh, uh, wrote a paper on his social influence model. And he explicitly wrote this for experts, uh, expert witnesses to be able to have a framework for anyone to evaluate undue influence. Um, it ranges from the influencer to the influencee and purpose and techniques and timing and setting. And of course the methods and techniques is where my bite model falls firmly into that. Um, so I'm not only trying to pull together the existing laws, the existing models on brainwashing and mind control and connect it with um, uh, the mental health system, but for my study, uh, it's been quite an interesting journey and I'm now bitten by the research bug. Uh, so I intend to do a lot more research, which I'll cover at the end of this presentation. But essentially I took um, all of the elements of the bite model, things like control of food, control of sleep, control of clothing, etc., And I turned it into a, a scaled thing where people could say it never happened to them, always happened to them or in between. And so um, we asked lots of demographic questions and we had a bunch of items. And, in, and what we were wanting to do is develop this uh, instrument uh, of the bite model. We, we, we took the, the original bite model, turned it into Likert scales. We had people reviewing it who were experts. We tested it on some people. We did some edits and then we posted it on uh, SurveyMonkey. Um, and here's an example of what it looked like and people would be coding it never to always. Uh, things like I felt forced to be obedient to leaders and group rules or I felt pressured to obey even when I disagreed with the rules. Um, so these are some of the behavioral control um, questions that scored over 0.7, which I decided uh, that was, was highly significant. And so we disregarded uh, the ones that were lower. Information control, the highest thing was evasion, misdirection, changing the subject was used to avoid critical questions, 
lying, especially to outsiders to advance the group aims, uh, not honestly answering critical questions, uh, distorting information. And thought control, um, asking critical questions was a sin, essentially, or people were in rebellion. And it was always the dogma or the group policy over them as an individual. And there was no other alternative belief systems that, that offered any, any validity whatsoever. And, and I'm not gonna read all of them. And I will post the recording of this for those of you who wanna go through it more slowly and the dissertation itself will get published. Um, and emotional controls, um, essentially phobia indoctrination scored the highest that if you didn't do what the group wanted you to do, terrible things would happen to you. That scored 0.835. Uh, also in the mindset of someone uh, in a mind control or authoritarian cult, there was no future. If you ever left, only terrible things would happen. There was no happiness, no fulfillment if you left. And people were taught to block any negative emotions like homesickness or wanting to sleep longer um, or, or not uh, liking to be abused and bullied. So what was so interesting and totally surprising was when we did a, a, a principal component analysis, a factor analysis on the results of the study, they all came down to one thing called control. And it makes sense if you think about it. A, uh, I started writing about the bite model over 30 years ago and I knew it fit my experience and it fit the experiences of the thousands of people that I've met. Um, and people to this day keep reading combating cult mind control and seeing how the bite model saved their lives. So it made sense that behavior control, information control, thought control and emotional control would come up as control. But one of the interesting things uh, in the last four years is I've been participating every Wednesday at the program in psychiatry at the law that's associated with Harvard Medical School and learning from some of the top forensic psychiatrists and psychologists and attorneys who are part of this think tank. And they, some of them were, Steve, undue influence is a known quantity. Don't mess around with it. It's gonna be an uphill battle pick a new term and you can define it. It was their advice. And, and as we did the analysis, it turned out that, oh, let's call it authoritarian control. And I looked it up in the dictionary and blind submission to authority, suppression of individual thoughts and free will. And I went, Eureka, <laughs> that's what we're gonna call it. So from that moment on, instead of calling it the bite model of mind control, it's now the bite model of authoritarian control. And here's uh, some of the scree plots from those four um, uh, dimensions. And as you can see, there's just super high significance and then it drops off quickly and the rest, the variance is really noise because what stands out uh, so powerfully is um, control, essentially. Um, and the, the two things down here were really in, in the fives, 0.5, and we decided to just focus on the, the highest significance possible. And with the component matrix, uh, just some of the things that didn't score that high, they're still significant. And I think in future research, we're going to want to um, look at these and, and, and flesh them out some more. But for now, the critical thing is that we got such a high significance um, uh, for authoritarian control from the bite model um, that we really think that this is, uh, as Judy said at the beginning, operationalizing a very uh, difficult concept. And instead of the slippery slope uh, argument of one person's cult is another person's religion or who's to say, 
uh, or blaming the victim. Uh, the bite model and the influence continuum can be a term that lawyers can use, uh, expert witnesses can use potentially to explain to judges and juries. Um, I also wanted to comment that, that there's a term, and thanks to Rich Applebaum for this, uh, of Adorno's study on authoritarian personalities. And Altmaier continued that research looking at, in Shefflin's terms, the influencee and like what makes the person susceptible to control and influence. And I have a lot of ideas about that, including uh, lack of secure attachment, including corporal punishment, but those are other studies. Um, again, what, what uh, I'm so excited about is that the bite model um, is a behavioral uh, frame that anybody can look at and apply to anything from a controlling relationship to a government, an authoritarian government. Uh, and I wanted to include a few demographics in terms of my study, which was done anonymously online through SurveyMonkey. The majority of the respondents were women. Uh, most came from the United States, but other English speaking countries, not surprisingly, because the study was in English. Um, but I really think that there are other factors, other forces, I should say, of undue influence that need to be uh, looked at uh, further, including uh, the, the hypnotic techniques, which are rampant right now on YouTube and on social media, um, issues of sleep deprivation, which America as a society, we're all sleep deprived, which make us, makes us more vulnerable to uh, uh, disinformation and recruitment into crazy groups like QAnon. Uh, which is a destructive cult, phobia, indoctrination, and threats. Um, and, you know, the implications can be potentially huge because instead of just helping elderly people uh, concerned about their property and their inheritance, uh, I believe this is a huge step, potentially a huge step forward to um, all kinds of amelioration of, of, of hurtful uh, acts, whether it's, uh, I wrote a blog about a divorce attorney in Ohio who um, was hypnotizing his female clients, raping them and giving them amnesia. And he was uncovered with the help of uh, one of his victims and the police but there's no law for what he was doing. I mean, he raped them, so there was a law, but there was no recognition by the law currently that the use of covert hypnosis should be a crime. And I can add that the, the country of Israel actually passed the law that you have to be a clinical uh, healthcare professional to do hypnosis or to say you're doing hypnosis. At least they have a step in the right direction. We have nothing like that in the United States. Um, I have clients whose loved ones are adults, but they're clearly being manipulated, exploited, and controlled. But because they're over the age of majority, uh, they have no legal recourse to help their loved one. And this includes women and men who are being sex trafficked by pimps who are using drugs and hypnosis to keep people enslaved. But, but families have no legal recourse. And I'm hoping potentially there can be a way that families can go to a judge and say, your honor, here's, here's the Shefflin uh, uh, social influence model. Here's the influence continuum and the bite model. And here's what is being done to our loved one, can we please have, please have temporary custody for even a week to get the person away from that environment and to, to educate them? Um, and other things that I'm really interested in studying is the harm that's been caused by people who have been subjected to authoritarian control, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, dissociative problems, panic and anxiety attacks, 
And I'm also very interested in hypnosis. It's something I've been studying since 1980 um, and the whole issue of suggestibility, compliance to authority. Um, and my friend who's a, who's a PhD from Harvard School of Public Health has been telling me for almost 20 years, Steve, you need to do an epidemiological study to figure out the scope, how many people are being impacted here and what's the public health ramifications, the, the, the implications um, in terms of productivity, uh, healthcare, uh, people who are being uh, institutionalized in psychiatric hospitals who have not been properly diagnosed. So I'd love to see that done. I'm also very interested in seeing if big data can offer us some really concrete uh, support for the, this social influence model to demonstrate um, uh, when someone is being a predator and, and unethically influencing someone. So I added hypnosis and NLP, what's known as neurolinguistic programming. Um, and I, 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 I wanted to uh, end by saying the last few months I've been studying QAnon uh, in depth. I did a TEDx uh, 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 that was 90 minutes with fellow researchers, David Troy and Jim Stewartson. Um, and it really is a destructive authoritarian cult. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, and with that, I am going to wrap up my, my presentation and thank you. And thank, thank you, Judy. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Christine. And thanks for all of, uh, uh, all of you for helping me over these years. And I'm well, thank you for our wonderful presentation. That was really nice. Thanks a lot, Steve. I think yeah, you did a good job here. <laughs> take this off. So, right. I, 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 did I go too fast or is it okay? No, you did fine. Okay. Well, you flew right through it, which is always great. Yeah. I, I hate talking to PowerPoints. I like talking to real people, people and when we're on Zoom. So this is the best we can do right now with the pandemic. Right. So the next, in the next part, part two of the FOR is that the committee is uh, going to ask some questions first and make some comments. And then we are going to open it to the public here. Great. So um, let's begin with Keith. Keith. Hey, Judy, thank you. Uh, Stephen, that, uh, thanks for a, a very clear uh, presentation. Uh, I've been fascinated with the work you're doing ever since our first conversation. Uh, and I, I mean, just sitting here listening to you talk through your, your discussion, I have uh, scribbled down all these notes about uh, both about your, your research specifically and its implications. It just goes in so many different directions. And as you know, I'm basically a social psychologist who spent a good part of my career thinking about the political implications of social psychology. So it, what, I mean, obviously this whole topic of influence runs right through this for social psychology. And here we are at a moment where the world is really interested in populism and authoritarianism and wondering how in the, why is it after all that so many people in so many places are moving toward authoritarianism? What's the appeal of that? It strikes me that your work, your curiosity, your clear writing about this is directly pertinent to one of the major things that's going on in the world right now. I mean, I know this is kind of a parenthesis, but a fellow I was just talking to this week, Sean Rosenberg. Do you know about Sean Rosenberg's work? He's the social psychologist who's a medical, mainly a political analyst and he's writing about populism and he's writing about under what circumstances are people susceptible to the influence of authoritarian leaders. So, so much of what you're writing, I, I know that you've worked with and, and had many conversations with people like Phil Zimbardo and a number of others. So I'm just, I'm fascinated with all these different directions that uh, your your work, work should take. Um, so, uh, I'm kind I of can start here. to answer some of what you've asked, but if maybe there's more. Yeah, well, I'm interested just in your thoughts about, uh, I, I mean, you're clearly wanting to take this in a number of different directions. Uh, are you interested in taking this into the kind of political uh, uh, realm and the populist? Obviously, your uh, the, the Trump cult book uh, does take this into 
uh, political realms. Uh, and and I, I, I just, I admire the way that you have done such a good job of taking your work into the world. Mm. Uh, and you are a role model for me, for a bunch of people in terms of not only how quickly you, you've been turning out body work, but how effective you are at, at networking with other scholars. So I really mm. salute you for that. And uh, uh, I think a, n- a number of us can learn from your example, but, uh, but you know, coming back to your, your thoughts about the, the application of your work in, in terms of understanding the appeal of, uh, of populism and uh, authoritarian leadership at a time when a lot of people clearly feel overwhelmed and anxious by what's going on and therefore are particularly susceptible. Right, so um, my bias is that I was uh, in a mind control cult that I later learned was a creation of the CIA and the Korean CIA for political purposes to counter North Korean brainwashing. And that was brought over to the United States. And as I wrote in the cult of Trump, ever since Edward Bernays, who wins 1928 book Propaganda, started connecting the dots with psychology and politics and marketing, Uh, we've seen an explosion of research and knowledge about how does the mind work? How do you change beliefs? Not to mention, how do we program computers to be more like humans? And the whole notion of scripting was coming out of the computer period of time. And so I definitely have a bias in the sense of, I think there are powerful government actors who um, wanna protect their countries, but part of that is doing disinformation campaigns, meddling with other elections and other using proxy groups or cults in other places. So I, I, I definitely, as I wrote in the cult of Trump, believe there's substantial evidence that Russia's uh, internet research agency has been active uh, in recruiting and, 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 and causing and fomenting conflict, influencing media, et cetera. But I want to also back up and say, you know, as a mental health professional, I've learned about notions like secure attachment versus insecure or disorganized attachment. And it, the, the, it, it seems clear that if, if you were raised in a healthy family and were not a victim of corporal punishment, where you were kind of programmed to obey authority instead of encouraged to ask questions and make mistakes, et cetera, you're kind of set up for a future where that's gonna be familiar for you. And in times of great anxiety, stress, and worry, more of the emotional part of the brain is working and less of our critical cortical faculties are working. And so we're going to be looking for someone who's kind of like a father figure, who's going to talk in a very powerful voice, uh, who's going to say, trust me, I got this. I know what I'm doing, etc. And it, and it's not rational. It's not using data and facts and science but there's, there, there's a, a feeling of security by listening to an authority figure who's talking with certainty. And, and I just, I, I really believe that we live not in a post-truth world, but the age of influence. And second to global climate crisis, understanding influence and teaching people how to protect their own minds and their family and their children is absolutely the second most important thing for the planet because also we have China in ascendance and they want to impose their way of being on the rest of us, which is classic authoritarianism. So if we love democracy and we want freedom, we're going to have to really get activist in the next 10 years, 20 years, because, and I think the whole notion of popularism is kind of a um, propaganda term, because I really think it, the issue is authoritarianism versus democratic human rights. Right. So, 
Forgive me if I was talking too long, but oh, thank you, thank you, Stephen. So much to explore here, but I'll just pass this I'll pass the baton, Judy, back to you and the other team members. Terrific work, Stephen. Thank you, Keith, so much. Whoops, I was trying. <laughs> Hang on. Oh, come on. No, you were there. Oh, there you I go. know. You were there. I'm too impatient. When I get there, I stab it again, and then I'm off, and then I stab it again, and I'm on. Anyway, um, thanks. I think Rich wanted to say Rich, something. Yeah, it's Rich's turn. And I want to just say, Rich, you are the dissertation chair of one of the my colleagues, Yanya Lalich, uh, who has been in the media like crazy around Nexium, etc. She became a sociologist. So one of your students. Thank, so you. thank you for joining my committee. I was going to say, Steve, in a commanding voice that we now release you from the cult of fielding. Um, <laughs> Forget it. I'm staying. <laughs> so um, Forget it. You, you never get away from fielding. <laughs> uh, so in response to Keith's questions, I sort of touched on many of the things I wanted to talk about. So I was going to pose... Um, question, which is actually a serious one, but you don't have to answer it. Do you have an authoritarian personality since you fell into um, the Moonies? Um, and backing up from that was your own upbringing of the sort, which would predict an authoritarian personality. You don't have to answer that. This isn't a therapy session. But I ask it only because the notion of an authoritarian personality is a, it's sort of an either or thing. You have it or you don't. But human beings are very complex. And, um, you know, so I thought reflecting on yourself might give some, for yourself, might give some insight um, on that. Um, so, you know, it's, it seems to me that there are well, first of all, so the Adorno Horkheimer, all the original study was designed really to show that there was an authoritarianism of the right, but not of the left. Um, because yeah, they I don't came agree from with the that. Right. right. They came from the critical Marxist tradition and, um, you know, basically, and that's what their F scale, their fascism scale right. showed. But um, you think that um, we're all guilty in a way, or potentially. And so, you know, one thought I have is, uh, you know, I don't know how you work this into your factor analysis and all of that, but authoritarianism is a continuum that interacts with other more sociological variables. I mean, uncertainty is clearly one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, for many people, uh, during an uncertain time, we cleave to certainty. Um, but it's one thing um, to, to find yourself in a cult, which is a total institution. That's what Yanya Lalit showed comparing Heaven's Gate with her Marxist Leninist feminist cult that she was a part of. Um, right. um, it's another thing. I mean, I'm totally troubled by the fact that uh, Trump actually got something like four or five million more votes in this election than he did in 2016. Does that mean that? nearly half of the American voting public has an authoritarian personality or are there other factors? What percentage of them might be cult-like? Is Trump a cult? I mean, it's all just bewildering to me. And you're in a position to begin to unpack this, but I think it's important to look at sociological factors as well as the purely psychological notion that X has an authoritarian personality, so they are susceptible. Um, but for the grace of God, I might find myself in a cult. And back in the heady days of the 1970s, I found myself doing and saying things uh, that are embarrassing now. And I'll make one other comment. Um, there's a movie recently released by Aaron Sorkin, The Trial of the Chicago Seven, hmm. uh, which was about the conspiracy trial after the Democratic Convention with Tom Hayden, Abby Hoffman, all those people. And watching it and watching it 1987 version, which is actually based on the transcripts, which was much better. Um, I realized how close I was to some pretty crazy stuff. Mm. So I'll just toss that all out to you. I also yeah. want to thank you for having 
one of the uh, the briefest, most succinct, and effective final orals. You didn't spend 50 minutes going through your literature view. So you asked if you went too fast. I thought you went just fine. Oh, great. I'm so pleased. So I, I guess I want to start by, uh, and Keith, uh, the social psychologist, uh, talk about the fundamental attribution error for a minute, which says that when people are trying to understand other people, there's a bias to overestimate individual or dispositional variables and to underestimate the context or the social environmental variables. And so why did Steve get in the Moonies? He was weak, he was stupid, he didn't come from a good family. Uh, I haven't heard the authoritarian personality one in 44 years, but there's always new things to learn. Um, but the kind of blaming the victim versus Steve was a creative writing major, read three books a week, loved women, uh, was gonna be a college professor and teach writing. Uh, and then his girlfriend dumped him and three women started flirting with him at the student cafeteria, lied to him, and then invited him to dinner and on this incremental social influence. Blame the women, Steve. Blame the women. Uh, I, I, it's I've always been a weakness. Of my, and I should say <laughs> I'm the youngest of three. I have two older sisters and I was largely raised by my sisters, my mom and my grandmother because my father worked in the hardware store six days a week, you know, 12 hours a day. But um, I don't think I was an authoritarian personality and I don't, I mean, you can ask my wife uh, and my sister, et cetera. And but, you um, I, I do want to say that when I became a Mooney, I, I was told to become a small Sun Myung Moon and think like him and feel like him and walk like him and talk like him. And the higher up I got promoted, the more I started becoming a small Sun Myung Moon. And I became a narcissist and I became a power hungry, you know, person who, you know, wanted to help run the world when we took over. Um, and when I exited the cult, aside from feeling shame and guilt and embarrassment over all the people I had recruited in and all the activities I had done, I realized that I still had in my brain the, the, these neuron, these neuronal structures where before the Moonies, I was like timid to speak publicly uh, and, and in the cult, I was speaking extemporaneously to a thousand people. And when I got out, I was like, I think I can do public speaking <laughs> based on what I've learned in the Moonies and I should speak out against this, etc. So, you know, I think when people are involved with a totalist experience like I was, it changes you forever. But uh, I really believe, and this is what I teach my clients that I help, is to be in your body in the here and now <laughs> with a positive future orientation mm -hmm. and not, you know, feel like you're uh, a prisoner of the past or having to relive things from the past. Um, I do believe we're, as human beings, we're biosocial human, you know, organisms. We learn and I've, I've watched the QAnon videos, recruitment videos, I've, I've read the tweets, et cetera. And I, it's easy for me because of my professional experience to step into those shoes and understand how people can think that Trump is God's agent on earth. Just as 45 years ago, I was fasting for three days for Nixon because God wanted Nixon to be president during Watergate. And I, I really see it. What's different now is the digital age and, and docs like the great hack, uh, social dilemma and people you may know. What's happening now is our brains are being rewired remotely and we're addicted to these things. And cults don't need you to go to an isolated place and wear special clothing anymore. You just need to be on the right have the right uh, texts and notifications. So those are a few thoughts. Right, so in a way, um, we no longer have to be members of total institutions, but rather we become members of silos 
on social media, um, you know, I still, I still, I'll, I'll end with this. Please. I don't want to believe that everybody who voted for, I know we're not supposed to be political, but I'm going to be, I don't want to believe that everybody who voted for Trump is, did it for cult-like reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be, it would make me feel a lot more secure if I had some idea what percentage are totally beyond reach because they're so locked into this Twitter feed um, and all of that. And how many just did it because they thought Biden would shut down the economy and they'd be out of a job. So they voted for the lesser of two evils. I mean, it's that kind of a range of things. No, there's no question that fear of the other is was part of the total Trump playbook. Uh, and has been uh, a, a part of the playbook. Um, my, uh, there was an uh, op-ed in the New York Times today by Catherine Stewart, who wrote The Power yeah. Worshippers, and she was talking about the Christian right, which features heavily in, in the Cult of Trump book. And these folks really have a black and white, all or nothing view where they think that separation of church and state is wrong, and that America was a Christian you know, nation, and we need to serve them. And we also need to serve people who have fossil fuel interests. Uh, right. And that Trump and that Trump was a gift from God. Yeah, it's right. it's uh, so if you're in a if you're in a authoritarian cult where you are told your leader is an apostle or a prophet and he protects you from satanic entities attacking you and he has the power to, to speak in tongues and cast out demons. And he says, God wants you to vote for Trump. Do you think you're gonna do anything but? And, we, and we're looking at tens of millions of Americans who are in these, these organizations. I, I have a quick here. comment. I have a quick comment. Uh, estimates of people who uh, won an authoritarian leader in any country at any time is about 25%. That's interesting. So I wanna just give kudos to Michael Commons who is head of research at the forensic think tank. And it was Michael who said, your work's important. If you wanna change the law, you need to go get a PhD, go to fielding. I'll, I'll, I've, I've sent students there. I'll help supervise your research. And so, Michael, thank you profoundly. Thank you for feeding our cult, Michael. <laughs> yeah. Can I pop I in think here? It's a cult. Please, uh, my student reader, oh, uh, PhD graduate from Fielding, Christine. Thank you. First of all, I am a survivor also of the cult experience. So I was particularly impressed with Steve's work. One of the things that I loved was his focus on coercion, because people think that human trafficking, for example, is revolving around physical force. The psychological chains that exist in human trafficking are the same psychological chains, the, or, the authoritarian control that is used in, in, in cults. So that, I think, is beautiful, how you laid it all out. You described different frameworks for undue influence. And one of the other things I appreciate about it is that it is very non-committing of the fundamental attribution error. In other words, your research shows that critical thinking can be turned off and free will can be subverted by the situations, by the bite model, by the experiences around you. It's not a matter of what, you know, what was your flaw, what was your vulnerability, right. really a matter. The important thing that your research shows is that it's more important what happened to you, which is important in order to stay safe. Because if everyone thinks, you know, I'm being unduly influenced by one of these authoritarian figures only happens to people with this personality type, then they won't be on guard and it could happen to them as you know, and as I know. And okay, so another thing I was wondering was if there was one particular moment 
when you realized you had to do this study, I can, or, or one case, because I am also in this field and I can see several, I mean, numerous cases where your research, had it been existent, then it could have been used to change the outcome of certain cases. Mm-hmm. Because people who are adults who go through this kind of manipulation and exploitation are often blamed and they don't have, the court has not had the ability to, or the tool to say, this is why your authoritarian leader needs to be held responsible instead of you. It, was there a moment when, or a case? It's, it's, it's been a, a journey, Christine, honestly, and uh, learning about trafficking happened for me about uh, seven years ago when I was invited by Carissa Phelps to do a training for law enforcement. And it was my first opportunity to sit down with trafficking survivors and really dissect their experiences and compare it with mine. And the woman who helped me the most was someone you know, Rachel Thomas, uh, who was recruited at Emory College by a CEO pimp um, and who read Combating Cult Mind Control during her rehab and said, this was the book that helped me the most understand what had happened to me. And we went on to develop Ending the Game, which is the first um, uh, course for uh, sex trafficking survivors to understand pimp mind control. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm trying to do with your help, Christine and others, a a hashtag I got out social movement in, in in the tradition of the Me Too movement to try to create an environment where there's less stigma attached to the notion that, yup, it happened to me and I'm smart and I'm not defective, Um, to create an exit ramp for so many Trump supporters and QAnon believers, et cetera. And again, what we need is, is preventive inoculation as well as vaccinate, you know, the vaccination, but as well as therapeutics and as well as a, a long-term recovery plan to help folks recover. I think I am having a lot of, oh, Christine, are you still talking? I'm sorry. Oh, Go no, ahead. I'm, I'm good. I'm having a lot of trouble with my computer. It keeps going off for no reason at all. Uh-oh. So now I'm sitting in the corner on the floor next to the, next to the electrical outlet, <laughs> but uh, I do want to open it to the audience before we go. So um, does anybody out there have a question? Just unmute yourself and go forward. I had a comment, uh, Judy. Um, I think that people who are susceptible to magic um, are the people who are targeted by cults. It's not a particular personality, uh, but uh, there are people, uh, I've, I've been studying informally, uh, people who uh, have been approached by cults who immediately were turned off by them and resisted it because they don't believe in false promises and they don't believe in magic. And yeah. I think that uh, uh, there are a lot of people who, can't be recruited, but I don't think blaming the person is ever an excuse for the treatment cults give people. Yeah, and I wanna say categorically, no one I've ever met in 44 years knowingly joined the cult. They thought they were gonna improve their life. They thought they were gonna make the world a better place. So it's not like a recruiter comes in and says, hey, give up all your free will and be my slave. Right. Maybe in B and D world it is, but not in my experience where there's lying right. and coercion. Well, I'm just uh, I'm just saying there's some people who, when they listen to the original message of improvement, they're doubtful. Because I was the- I I was doubtful too, but I didn't even know it was religious for for the first week. I mean, they really snowed me. 
because they knew I would be resistant if they told me. And it was months before I learned that Moon was the Messiah, the greatest man in human history, and we were going to bow to the floor uh, whenever he came into the room. Yeah, I didn't know that either. <laughs> uh, Steve, I, I just want to be quick. Thank uh, you, Gary. Brilliant, brilliant and... Uh, I see you, Ellen. Uh, a, per a personal treasure to see your growth and to hear it and to uh, look forward. Uh, I, I have many pages of notes. Maybe we can meet. Uh, but Would love to, Barry. I'd say, th yeah, the quintessence, uh, uh, what I learned from torture and how people survive, our human ties and bonds and connections are the a priori categorical imperative of culture and civilization. And uh, you are uh, 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 unpacking and parsing out uh, some of the dark stuff on the other side. And it's there and it's important and we need to neither uh, minimize it nor uh, get overwhelmed that it's there. But mm. uh, wonderful and uh, great gratitude and and admiration. Oh, thank you, Barry. Uh, so Barry and Michael are part of this forensic think tank at Harvard Medical School. And Barry is one of the foremost experts on torture uh, as a forensic psychiatrist. So I'm honored wow. that you took time to come for this. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Ellen had a, a question and then uh, we'll uh, have a celebration. As, uh, as someone who grew up in the seventies uh, in Northern New Jersey, and I remember the Moonies, in Newark Airport with the flowers, coming up and asking for donations. The kind of cult education I got growing up from my mom was you know, sort of very much about the Moonies and about that kind of framework. And as a fellow parent of teenagers, my question is, um, what would you advise parents in this whole social dilemma, new media context, um, worrying about the people at the airport with flowers is currently not our problem. How, how do we think about this one? And what do we say to our kids? Thank you. And I want to do kudos to you, Ellen, because Ellen, I, 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 Ellen has done business consulting for me for years. And when Michael said you should go get your doctorate, Ellen, it gets a lot of credit for pushing me, uh, as well as my wife, Misha, who said, yeah, you should go and do it. So thank you, Ellen. I think, you know, I've been thinking a lot about if I was asked by the incoming administration, like, what do we do for kids and education? Uh, I'm thinking more and more about um, Philip Zimbardo's Heroic Imagination Project, which is a curriculum for young people to teach them using modules of videos, uh, to teach them social psychology, things like the Ash Conformity Study, the Milgram Obedience Study, the Zimbardo Prison Study, and other things to create educated citizens so that their internal locus of control you know, is intact, but also to create a web of trust with, with people they can reality test if they hear of something before they get go down a dark corridor on the internet, they go, hey, what do you think of this? And we can try to, to protect and get guardrails up, but ultimately teach them how to, to fend for themselves. So simple things like, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. <laughs> like if the greater the promise, the greater you need burden of proof for them mm -hmm. to prove it, not for us to disprove it. Like mm -hmm. things like that. Um, uh, that will really help um, uh, empower people. Young people need hope and they need to be empowered. And there's so much energy now through the election cycle that we need to build on, in my opinion, to turn this country away from authoritarianism. Judy Mohammed Amer, who just recently also had a brilliant FOR, also has a question. Th th thank you, Amer. Rich. Thank, thank you very much. And congratulations, Steve and Dr. Hassan. Uh, this, this, this was a terrific uh, FOR. And you were succinct and to the point, uh, not, not as I was. So congratulations on that. Uh, Mohammed, you had a very different kind of dissertation with Arabic music and a totally different thing. No comparison. Uh, th thank you.
So I, I, I was very curious about, uh, you know, the, the, the hope for the, for the youth, uh, you know, we talk, you know, change is inevitable, uh, uh, anti-status quo, uh, looking for something to believe in, uh, yet we're, we are really society, we're being atomized, uh, uh, Durkheim's enemy, uh, Chomsky's manufacturing consent, and how, are we just all more susceptible now to be unduly influenced? And is this something that we just need to be kind of going through in a cycle? Or is this, uh, or, or is there a counter awareness that needs to be happening? 100% uh, there needs to be education. Like for me, uh, when I met Jim Stewartson and we wound up doing a TEDx on dismantling QAnon, I, I was not a video gamer. Like I, I am 66. Like I missed video gaming uh, and maybe gladly, but he was describing alternate reality gaming, which is the structure of QAnon with the Q drops to get people addicted into this, you know, game solving world, et cetera. In other words, and then the, to understand that, that enemies of, of Americans have gathered thousands of data points on each of us to know what foods we like, what music we like, what social things we do, what we don't like. Even if we go to a website to look about depression, it's gonna be part of our profile. And then the, this information is being sold to third parties, whether they're churches looking to recruit new members or other cults that are looking to recruit new members. And one of the one of the lifting points is called mystical manipulation, where the person has the sense that the person has mystical knowledge about them, but they actually found it out by talking to their neighbor or they talk to their recruiter or whatever. But now you can get such detail anonymous, you know, from the internet that unless you understand this and unless you in a sense have some force fields out around yourself as new ideas and people come into your life where they have to kind of pass the sniff test, um, we're really in trouble in my opinion because our brains are getting changed by our, our technology. Th thank you, doctor. <laughs> Thank you. I want to acknowledge, I see my next door neighbor growing up, Monica, who tried so hard to talk me out of the Moonies and who baked me chocolate chip cookies after my deprogramming. Monica, did you want to say anything? I, I actually had a couple of thoughts, but I'll just go to one thing this week that was particularly disturbing um, was these patients, COVID patients coming off ventilators uh, in areas of the country where the virus is surging and exploding and having been near death and the first words out of their mouth when they speak are that this is a hoax. Now, that's frightening enough, um, but how do we take care of the healthcare workers who are beyond able to comprehend this kind of behavior and denialism. Um, the incongruence of this is, you know, devastating to them and taking a toll on them. How can we help them? I think we're, we're in a, a period of time between now and January 20th, where we're trying to put public pressure on the, on the Trump administration to start coordinating a pandemic response. Um, where we can try to save lives and start getting messaging that's actually fact-based and, and expert-based and medical-based. But um, my, my understanding is that, and I actually made a, a, a short video this before this presentation calling it a death cult um, because people are dying and, and, and the Trump doesn't care and the administration doesn't seem to care that people are, are being misinformed and people are being encouraged to rebel against having to wear masks. Um, I wish I could say I had all the answers. I don't, but I think we need like think tanks of the most brilliant minds to sit together and really think about this 
uh, structurally on how we how we need to proceed. I, so. I have yeah. one comment. I have one very short comment. Okay. Uh, the more scientific the culture is and the more science education they engage in, uh, the less of people belong to cults. Well, I, I, I definitely want to see experts. You know, I talk about in my book, Fourth Generation Warfare, that undermines uh, experts and leaders and institutions. I'm a big fan of, of what you're saying, but I don't think it's enough, Michael. I think we need actual teaching about what is hypnosis, how is it done, how to recognize it, and we need laws that will put people in jail if they're using these techniques to harm other people. Well, I think it's uh, what they do is criminal. So I, yes. I, I always back your plan to criminalize it. Yeah, yeah. I think I, it is. I would uh, pick up. But uh, we know it's criminal because there are all these lawsuits uh, that have been brought in the last few years uh, against uh, uh, Scientology, against uh, uh, the Nexium. Uh, and and so forth and what has changed is people are now recognizing that that it is uh coercive and exploitative yep thank you i, I would follow what you said about the the hope for children with a meme that i heard about 40 years ago we can have ignorance and despair and paralysis or its counterpart which is information hope and action Information, hope, and action. I like it. Write it down, nice. Monica. We'll talk later. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. It's wonderful we had so many people here. Stephen, you did a wonderful job. Thank Congratulations, you. Dr. Hassan. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> thank you for so much. And thank you, Rich, for joining the committee and Keith and and, and Michael, especially Ellen, uh, Misha, my wife, Misha Landau, who- I just, yeah, for, and I just wanted to congratulate you. <laughs> you thank you. Well, so. Thank you. Know, you, when, you met, Misha. when we first met, he said life with him would never be boring. And that is really <laughs> true. You were always somebody with incredible curiosity and a drive to know, but you're also a man of action. And the mm -hmm. fact that you took this idea of doing a doctoral, you know, a, a thesis, a PhD, in such a short time and made it actually happen is just really. Well, I think incredible. it's due also to Judith. <laughs> and Steve, and so thank 100 you. Yes, I've Judith. heard so much about you, so I'm really happy to meet you. Right, yes. you modestly said you don't have all the answers, but you have a PhD now, so you must have all the you answers. You must have all the answers, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> All okay. Um, is, thank you all. Have is the answers. Great. Well, I think we'll end for today and uh, hope to see. Well, we'll definitely see you at graduation. So everybody's invited to see the graduation that Jean Pierre is putting together. Jean Pierre is putting together a virtual graduation, and it was very successful last uh, summer. So I think it's going to be really fun this. Uh, January to January 30th for anyone January? 4 p.m. Eastern time for if anyone <laughs> wants to I'm gonna buy a robe and everything and stick it on my head and, <laughs> and, yeah. and well, Stephen you are the host so you can end the meeting okay thank you everybody